The countdown is once again underway at Cape Canaveral for the attempt to launch astronaut John Glenn into orbit around the world. Reporting to the British Broadcasting Corporation in London. The zero hour for Colonel Glenn Floyd. In Florida, where, one more time, the last minutes of American astronaut. We have been waiting for the last American astronaut, John Glenn, in Cape Canaveral, Florida. يتحضر مرة ثانية لدورته حول العالم. فلوريدا جو كانا فاكو تاي كون خان شيران يوهان جيلين. كيف كنا بدورتا؟ أمريكا نو جو هيكوشي جون غلن نو سوكيو نو كوزيني. جيكتو ميركوريو أن ريبورتادو كي أمبوس الأسترونالتا إيسو كويتي فرينشيب سيتي. And report the astronaut's condition as excellent. Colonel Glenn at Cape Canaveral. And then astronaut Glenn will weather still remains the big question mark. But the countdown for Colonel John Glenn, the countdown is again underway. With the entire world as our witness, the countdown begins at Cape Canaveral, Florida, for one of man's greatest adventures. It begins here, with these men, for they are the launch team. And from now until the instant of flight, the fate of today's mission rests principally upon their skills and judgments. The countdown is their master plan and they proceed through its ritual with unhurried deliberation. Its pages contain the timetable of order they must follow to awaken a giant machine, to test its readiness, and to prime it for the one supreme moment for which it was created. now, meter reads 19 volts. Bubble stand by on, now meter reads 11.5. Six volt isolated... Minute after minute, page upon page, the count continues. And in the night beyond this blockhouse, a modified Air Force Atlas rocket now hums with restless energy beneath a Mercury spacecraft as these men usher it toward its final minutes on Earth. Today is February 20th, 1962. And today, if all goes well, the men here will launch an American astronaut into orbit around the world in a spacecraft which he has named Friendship 7. Friendship 7 awaits its pilot, and the pilot has waited three years for this day. Three long, arduous years of study, of training, of waiting. And now he's ready. His name is John Glenn. Astronaut John Glenn of New Concord, Ohio. Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps. Married, father of two teenage children. Glenn has been a pilot over half of his 40 years. Has flown in two wars. And is a veteran test pilot who five years earlier established a transcontinental flight record as the first man to average supersonic speeds across America. He volunteered for space flight. He is one of seven astronauts selected for Project Mercury, the man and space program directed by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <laughs> Two teammates have pioneered the way into space for Glenn. Astronauts Alan Shepard and Virgil Grissom 
tested the Mercury spacecraft on trailblazing suborbital missions, proving the equipment and pushing the program to the threshold of orbital flight. And now, it's Glenn's turn. Ready for pressurization. Now to Glenn falls the challenge of man's next advance into space, for he has been chosen to cross the threshold gained by Shepard and Grissom and to orbit the world. So the countdown continues for John Glenn. And it continues beyond this room for Friendship 7. And it continues this moment around the world. are John Glenn's ground-based co-pilots, men he knows well, with whom he's trained, and in whose judgment his life is entrusted this day. They are the flight controllers, and from the Mercury Control Center, within view of the launch complex, they make the decisions, issue the commands, that will govern the course of the mission. To these men throughout the flight will flood the facts needed for decision. The scope of their responsibility, of the entire operation, defies comprehension. Now, this very instant, the countdown for flight continues around the world, on three continents, on islands, in ships and planes, in lands where it's summer and tomorrow is near, in lands where it's winter, and this day is just beginning. Roger, how about you recovering? Uh, the Carrico. Roger, recovery. Uh, Roger, CTC, Mercury Control Sirens, go. Northeast of Cape Canaveral, 1,000 miles into the Atlantic, dawn's early light spills over the British Crown Colony of Bermuda, and Station 2 in the Mercury Network proceeds with the countdown. The tracking and telemetry stations, 18 and all, form an avenue of electronic checkpoints around the world to monitor and communicate with Friendship 7 as it passes overhead. of the station, then telemetry is the ears. Each second, telemetry will hear and record nearly 2,000 items of information radioed down from Friendship 7. And in the months to come, engineers and scientists will find in telemetry records the answers needed for the bolder space explorations of the future. Displays and recorders have been calibrated. Roger, thank you. Flight, this is m &O. Go ahead, m &O. All soft systems status green. Roger, m &O. Understand all systems green. Latitude, 5 degrees north. Longitude, 10 degrees west. A spot in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa. And station three, the Rose Knot, waits under the late morning sun for John Glenn. Operating out of Trinidad, Rose Knot will communicate with Friendship 7 and monitor its journey as it streaks across the empty ocean and out over Africa. Operation, this is Bridge. We are proceeding at slow speed at about five knots. The course is 198 through over. the Mercury Station on Gran Canary Island in the Spanish archipelago off of the African coast 
It's midday at Station 5 in Kano, Nigeria, deep in the continent of Africa. Flight data recorded here at Kano and at Zanzibar on Africa's east coast will relay through this transmitting station to London and then on to America. Far to the southeast of Kano, beyond the Zanzibar station, the ship's bell of the coastal sentry tolls the twilight of day in the emptiness of the Indian Ocean. To the east, some 2,500 miles from the coastal sentry, dust blankets the network's eight station at Muche, near Perth, Western Australia halfway around the world okay. from Cape Canaveral. And the printout, color display. Okay, that's fine. Just uh, tweak it up on here. Today, February 20th, is fast fading over the Australian tracking sites at Muche and Woomera. And when Glenn arrives, tomorrow we'll greet him. But north and east across the Pacific, Far beyond the Mercury Station on the Coral Atoll called Canton Island, February 20th is just minutes old on Hawaii's Garden Island of Kauai, and there men prepare for the arrival of Friendship 7. Board site and ready for a 165 check. All right, sir. All right, sir. Eastward again, deeper into the day that will soon awaken over the Americas. Eastward to the Gulf of California, and to the Mercury Station at Guaymas, Mexico. Real good, just waiting for liftoff. m and OTM, status green, proceeding with pre-pass calibrations. North of Mexico, in the pre-dawn along the west coast of the United States, the mountaintop station at Point Arguello, California, waits out the long countdown, ready to track John Glenn. All right, Roger, Aggie. What is the present count? All right, Roger. Southeast now, to the farmlands of Texas, where the station at Corpus Christi continues its preparations for flight. I must count in Texas, please. Hey, permit. Roger, all systems, would you please commence pre-flight calibrations at this time since the countdown is progressing normally. Advise me when you have completed them. Far to the north and east of Corpus Christi beats the heart of the worldwide Mercury Network the computing and communication center that bonds it into a working entity. This is the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Through here funnels the voice and teletype communications that link the global stations to Mercury control. The computers enable men to reach judgments within the flashes of time allowed for control of a spacecraft that moves faster than a brain can react. Throughout the flight, the computers will generate recommendations on whether the mission should continue or be aborted. They will determine locations of the spacecraft, the time it should begin re-entry, the point at which it will land. And the most vital of these findings will be transmitted instantaneously to Cape Canaveral. Around the world, all is ready. The men, the stations, the space vehicle. And now reporters learn from the astronaut's information officer if the most vital of all elements is ready, the man himself, John Glenn.
what are the thoughts of a man about to rocket into history? Glenn is the astronaut, the man who will challenge space. But he is just one member of an international scientific endeavor that requires the genius and skills of some 40,000 other men and women scattered throughout the world. From the engineers and technicians who produce the space vehicle to the crews now preparing to launch it. From the tracking experts who will chart his voyage around the globe to the sailors now waiting at sea to recover him. Behind this day stands years of preparation, of research and testing, of planning and training. And the purpose of it all is knowledge. Knowledge of space and of how effectively man and spacecraft can function together in its hostile environment. Knowledge that will serve as the basis for space explorations of the future. Hard-won knowledge of benefit to all men, bought by sacrifice and dedication and courage. Okay, all set. Yeah, all set. 
sound of John Glenn's life. His heartbeat, you hear, will flow from Friendship 7 throughout the flight, informing those on the ground how well he endures the trials ahead. Into the soft light of this Florida dawn emerges Friendship 7, making its debut to the day of its destiny. The Mercury Atlas stands alone, waiting to depart this Earth. A quarter of a million pounds of rocket with thrust equal to three and a half million horsepower. All to hurdle a 168-pound astronaut into space. All stations. Gantry is in launch position. EMR, CNS band beacons are on. Start interrogation in one minute. The countdown sweeps closer to the moment of flight and recovery teams here at the Cape and around the world ready themselves to aid the astronaut. Above all else, John Glenn's safety is paramount, the dictating factor in all planning. Never in all of history have so many people shared, without censorship, an adventure of such magnitude. Through all news media in all languages, all the peoples of the world are witness to this exploration of space to its success or failure. Capsule, go. 
All pre-start pilot lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oil evacuate. Mercury umbilical clear. Mercury is evacuate. Lights on. All recorders to fast. T minus 18 seconds and counting engine start. You need the wee one to be with you, Thomas. Good Lord, ride all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. Ten, nine, eight, seven. engine will shut down when Friendship 7 should separate from the booster rocket and begin orbital flight. Seco! Lots of grades fired. Okay. Roger, zero J, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. To John Glenn, now belongs an awesome panorama. The world curving beneath him, just as it was filmed from an earlier Mercury capsule. And I could see the booster during turnaround just a couple of hundred yards behind me. It was beautiful. Friendship 
seven. How does he look, Bermuda? Looks real good, K, but uh, surgeon reports everything okay, all systems okay, good voice contact both ways. Roger. Uh, friendship, seven anything to report on control system checks? Uh, not yet, everything appears to be going okay. I'm now on the yaw part of the check. We are right on schedule. Very good, very good. Oh, so far is excellent. Very good. No problems at all so far on control. Uh, Roger. Friendship 7, it's Bermuda. You're cutting out on UHF. Uh, if you read, go to HF. Roger, going. Friendship 7, Bermuda Capcom on HF. Friendship 7, Friendship 7. Friendship 7, I'll read you very weak. Uh, give me your status on control system check, please. Across Africa, races Friendship 7 at 17,545 miles an hour, 300 miles a minute, 4 miles for every heartbeat of John Glenn. Friendship 7 streaks through the night of tomorrow and races toward the dawn of yesterday. Above the Indian Ocean flashes Friendship 7, far beyond human sight, seen only by the electronic instruments of the coastal sentry as she records the lightning passage of the man in space. For John Glenn, the familiar time references of Earth no longer apply, for he journeys around our world in just 88 minutes, outracing the sun that needs 24 hours to circle the same globe.
very shortly you may observe some lights down there. You want to take a check on them out to your right, over. Uh, Roger, I'm all set to see if I can't uh, get them in sight. Uh, Roger. Uh, any symptoms of uh, vertigo or nausea at all, over? Uh, negative. No symptoms whatsoever. I feel fine, over. Good show. Oh, Roger, I do have uh, a lights in sight on the ground, over. Uh, Roger, I understand you're just off to your right there. That's affirmative. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of light, apparently right on the coast. Uh, I can see a, the outline of a town and a very bright light just to the south of it. Hey, Roger, that's Perth and Rockingham you're seeing there. Uh, Roger, the lights show up very well. And thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Uh, Roger, sure well, John. has lost contact, and Friendship 7 streaks home, an unseen comet darting across the land of its origin. Canaveral contact, how do you copy, over? Uh, Friendship 7 uh, to Canaveral, uh, read you loud and clear, how me, over? Roger, Friendship 7, Canaveral contact, read loud and clear, stand by the Capcom, please. Roger. Uh, Roger, still reading you. Uh, 7, this is Cape Coda, Bibi, you know. Uh, Roger, this is Friendship 7. Friendship 7, this is Bibi, the Capcom. Hey Roger, this is Friendship 7. I'm controlling fly by wire present time. I have no uh, left jaw, low thrust. Minor trouble aboard Friendship 7. A malfunction in the automatic control system was causing the spacecraft to yaw in skid-like fashion, away from its proper flight attitude. But Glenn is overriding the faulty system and now manually controls Friendship 7 on fly-by-wire, directing its movements by hand control, much like a pilot flies a plane. Fly-by-wire at present time. Understand? Friendship 7, this is Kano Capcom standing by. Kano Kano. Friendship 7, we have uh, telemetry solid and check all your systems out okay. Uh, we will remind you to start uh, pre dark side uh, checklist as soon as you lose contact with us. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is Boucher, come take. Friendship 7, this is Boucher, come take. Do read, over. Okay, this is Friendship 7 to me. Your Friendship 7, Boucher, Capcom. Uh, will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center of the off position. Uh, Roger, you haven't had any uh, banging noises or anything of this type at higher rates. Negative. All right, Roger, they wanted this answer. Right. Masked behind that routine report, the first hint of potential disaster. It came when astronaut Cooper relayed a request from Mercury Control, asking Glenn to check the status lights for the capsule's landing impact bag. Glenn reports, status normal. But ground stations are now receiving an ominous chilling signal, an indication that the heat shield on Friendship 7 seems to have come loose. Friendship 7, Hawaii contact. Hawaii, Friendship 7, Gilbert. Friendship 7, this is Hawaii Capcom. Uh, do you still consider yourself go for the next orbit? Affirmative, I am go for the next orbit. Roger, understand it. MCC confirms that they are go at the present time for third orbit. Friendship 7. 
7, Friendship 7, this is California Comtech. California Comtech, do you read? Over. control at Cape Canaveral, a decision must be made, and soon. The signal pulsing down from Friendship 7 indicates still that the heat shield is loose. Could the signal be erroneous? There is no way to tell. But if it's true, then John Glenn could perish in a searing inferno when he plunges back into the atmosphere. The retro rockets that slow the spacecraft and head it back toward Earth are strapped over the shield. If they were left on after retrofire, instead of being jettisoned as in normal re-entry, then their straps might hold the shield in place before they burn off. They might possibly save Glenn from the 3,000 degrees of re-entry heat until he's deep enough into the atmosphere for its force to hold the shield in place. But the decision must be made soon. Even now, Glenn is streaking toward the United States and he must begin the retro sequence 300 miles west of California if he's to land in the planned recovery area 700 miles south and east of Florida. We'll give you the countdown uh, for retro sequence time, John. You're looking good. Uh, Roger, we only have five zero seconds to retrograde. Over. Uh, that's a firm. I'll give you a mark, uh, 45 mark. California, uh, California, this is Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. So keep, tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. 20 Please. seconds. Right here.
Yeah, Roger, retracting scope manually. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Uh, we see no difficulty at this time in that type of re-entry. Over. Uh, Roger. Understand. Roger, friendship seven. Go ahead, keep uh, your ground. You're going out. with John Glenn and Friendship 7 is lost. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I think the uh, pack just let go. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Kate. Do you read? This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. Like heat of re-entry has created a barrier of ionization around Friendship 7, halting all voice communication. Alone, he plunges back toward Earth, a fiery meteorite. Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Kate. Do you read, over? Hello, Kate. Friendship 7, do you receive, over? The thickening atmosphere breaks his descent, slowing Friendship 7 from 17,500 miles an hour to 1,300 miles an hour in slightly over three minutes. And the forces of gravity slam against John Glenn until he weighs eight times his normal weight. destroyer Noah, waiting to recover Friendship 7. But John Glenn cannot hear the message. Right around 443, flight. It was about on time. Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. I Friendship 7, this is Cape. How do you read, over? All right, you're reading a lot and clear. How you doing? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. I said, if it breaks off, is that correct? Uh, Roger, altimeter off the pack indicating 80,000. Roger, reading it loud and clear. Rocking quite a bit. I may still have some of that pack on. I can't damp it either.
Coming down on 10, circles are open. Roger. Roger. Main chute is on green, chute is out in race condition at 10,800 feet in. Beautiful chute. Chute looks good. On O2 emergency and the chute looks very good. Rear of descent has gone to about 4.2 feet per second. The chute looks very good. Hello, Mercury Recovery. This is Friendship 7. Do you receive? Mercury, Friendship 7 is in steelhead. Loud and clear. Over. Right here, steelhead. Uh, Friendship 7, the chute looks very good. Over. of 81,000 miles through three days and three nights in just four hours and 56 minutes. At 3.04 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friendship 7 comes to rest aboard the United States destroyer, Noah, and John Glenn returns to the people of Earth. A change of clothes, a breath of cool air, a short debriefing. Then, Glenn leaves the NOAA, heading for the aircraft carrier Randolph, under the golden splendor of his fourth sunset of the day. team challenge space and they won follow tomorrow, and in the tomorrows after that, each step more bold as we reach out to explore the universe around us.